So, welcome to the chapter 13 Ecology Lecture. Lec oh, I'm off to a great start. Lecture. So, this chapter is going to uh, look at competition among living organisms. And unfortunately, it looks like I do not have this PowerPoint set up to where I can click to each new thing as we go along, but that's fine. So, this species here is called a cocoa damselfish. This is a male. Damselfish show sexual dimorphism, so the males look quite different from the females. Now, these guys, they show regular distribution on reefs around the island of Jamaica. If you remember from a previous chapter, uh, regular distribution means that the damp damselfish repel each other, so to speak. They form these territories which they guard quite vigorously from other damselfish. Male damselfish will vigorously defend their territory and they'll bite, slap, and tail slap, and chase until the intruder eventually says it's not worth the effort and gets out of their territory. And so you end up with these very distinct territories with cocoa damselfish. This is quite direct. We're talking direct physical action from one organism to another. And the name for that type of competition is interference competition, direct confrontation. Pretty much it, it always means there's something physically direct going on here, right? Damselfish bite, slap, and chase. That's a physical confrontation. Another term to note is intraspecific. Intra means within. Intramural sports are sports that are just done for fun within one college. It's not actual competition between multiple colleges. So intramural sports is within the same college and intraspecific competition is within the same species. Make sure this thing's recording. I don't trust my phone. We are recording. Excellent. So, intraspecific competition is competition within the same species. In this case, multiple members of the cocoa damselfish species physically fighting or defending against other cocoa damselfish. Let's look at some other examples of interference competition. On an exam, you would be expected to know interference competition and also be able to give some examples of it. Well, let's take a look at this top one. This species is a long-eared sunfish. The ear references this crazy little thing here. It's part of the operculum of the fish, which is the kind of the gill cover. And this is a male, bright male, colorful fish. Really cool if you ever go fishing to catch one of these. But if you go and look at a pond or a stream in the late spring, you'll find that on the bottom of the stream you have these indented areas and they're often guarded by individual male long ear sunfish. Other sunfish do this too. They dig out this nest that they will defend from other male fish. And so if another male fish does show up, The long-eared sunfish will actively chase that male away. It's kind of like the cocoa damselfish, except this one is native here. It actually lives in Missouri. It's pretty cool. So that's another example of territorial defense for interference competition. Sometimes the fighting is not for territory, but it's potentially to impress a mate. White-tailed deer, male deer, when they develop antlers, will have a direct confrontation. Bighorn sheep, even perhaps more stark where the males with the horns will run at each other. A lot of species that have some type of horn or antler ornamentation use it for physical defense or physical fighting, which is interference competition. One uh, other example is called injuring. That's the technical term for it. So, egrets. Egrets are wading birds. They feed on fish. They nest high above uh, the ground and trees in these large things called rookeries. It's like a gathering of, of egrets. This is what the young look like. Kind of feather down, kind of ugly if you look at them up close. But 
multiple young in one nest. Now, you thought your sibling rivalry, rivalry was pretty intense. These guys take it to another level. They will actively find the runt of the litter, and the egrets will poke at with their beaks, try and injure the other sibling so that they do not take food that could belong to the egrets themselves. So, egret number one, egret number two might injure the weaker egret so that each of them gets a greater amount of food. It's a type of competition. It's between members of the same species, even the same family, but it's still definitively competition. Growing over. All right, this might be tricky to see, but this is something called kudzu. This is an invasive vine that grows over all other plants. You can't see it too well, but this is a house right here. This is a building completely covered in this stuff. Now, all the other plants around that building are also covered in it, which means that they're not exposed to sunlight and they can't photosynthesize. They're going to die if they can't get the sunlight that they need. This plant grows over them, directly interfering with their ability to photosynthesize. It's a form of interference competition. If you go down to Georgia, Louisiana area, this is all over the place. Luckily, it hasn't really established a foothold here in Missouri. One that I don't have a picture is a lion. So a lion, a male lion, if that male lion displaces the dominant male of a pride, the first thing he will do is eat that other male's young. It's a win-win when you think about it from his perspective because he's getting energy from the consumption of the cubs and he's also eliminating the other male's genes because soon after that he'll mate with the lionesses and get his own genes there in that pride. So predation of young, growing over, injuring, fighting, territorial defense, these are all examples of direct physical confrontation. Right? And they can be intraspecific or interspecific. The lions, intraspecific. The kudzu growing over other plants, interspecific. Inter means between. An interstate is a road that goes between multiple states. So interspecific competition is competition between members of different species. In contrast to in, um, interference competition, in contrast to interference competition, exploitative competition involves indirect competition through the need of similar resources and an organism simply being better suited to survive in those conditions. So organisms, it is said that they outcompete other organisms by simply being better suited for environmental factors. A human example of this might be a small town with a bunch of mom and pop stores. Walmart shows up. They're able to sell things for less because they're a big business and have access to means of production, which allows them to sell things more cheaply. The smaller mom and pop stores don't make enough money anymore and they go out of business. Nobody from Walmart went up to somebody in the mom and pop stores and directly physically fought them, as interference competition would be, but instead they were able to outcompete them by the way they used their resources. Same thing as what we see in, in the uh, natural environment. This is a, short, a grove of shortleaf pines. So prior to European settlement, most of the Ozarks was covered in this. This was the dominant vegetation. 1800s up through the early 1900s, intense logging removed most of these, which created a new niche in the Ozarks, open hillside, what used to be forested hillside. That open, exposed area, that sunlight, favored the development of oak and hickory forests. 
So what we now have, after a hundred years of regrowth, is oak and hickory forest covering most of the Ozarks because once we logged all of the pines, we had a new set of circumstances, and in that new exposed set of circumstances with the increased sunlight that we had with the barren hillsides, oaks outcompeted shortleaf pine. Now they're dominant. They didn't directly necessarily interfere with these pines, but they simply were better suited. Exploitative competition. Why does competition occur? Obviously it would occur because of limited resources. If everybody has enough of everything, you might not see competition, but the fact is there aren't enough resources to go around for every living thing. And so resources are limited. Resource limitation, there's a finite or limited amount of a particular resource and living things fight to have access to those resources. The damselfish that we started with, the cocoa damselfish, space was the limiting resource. But other examples would include food, right? Water, perhaps sunlight, nutrient availability. There's a whole number of different things. Point is, none of this stuff tends to be unlimited. It is limited, and there is competition for it. This is once again, um, highlighting inter versus intra-specific competition. So intra-specific competition involves members of the same species, like the two lions there. It can include both interference, direct confrontation, like these lions are engaging in, or exploitative competition. Uh, natural selection, often it's exploitative competition that guides the evolution of living things. Certain organisms are just better suited for survival than others in that species, and so natural selection favors those genes. Interspecific competition involves competition between members of a different species. Here is a, here's an example of one. This is an eastern bluebird. This is Missouri's state bird. And this species over here is a house sparrow. We talked a little while back about invasive and introduced species. This is an invasive species. Both bluebirds and house sparrows are cavity nesters. They nest in cavities in trees or, as is the case with bluebirds, bluebird houses that we build for them. The problem is, house sparrows tend to be more aggressive and they tend to find their cavities, as far as I understand, earlier in the season than bluebirds do, which means a lot of bluebird houses end up going to house sparrows. It's not been good for the recovery of the bluebird. Back in the 70s, DDT thinned a lot of their eggshells, that was a pesticide that was used. And bluebirds have recovered quite a bit, but one thing that hinders their recovery is competition from house sparrows, a different species, interspecific competition. One important thing to know, and this would be, by the way, this would be exploitative competition. Generally, they don't physically fight for the cavity. The house sparrows simply find it first. Sometimes there may be a direct confrontation, but I've never really heard much about that. Keep in mind then when two things compete, that competition reduces the fitness of both competitors. Let's go back to our Walmart example. If Walmart comes into a town and sucks away a bunch of business from the mom and pop stores, the mom and pop stores are still getting some money, some business, which means that money that they're getting is money that Walmart is not getting. So if Walmart comes in, takes over and the local um, outdoors store gets a lot less business because people are just buying their stuff at Walmart, there's still some money being spent at the outdoors store that's not being spent at Walmart. If we got rid of all competition, Walmart would make all the money. So, likewise, any amount of competition between two organisms reduces the fitness of both of them. So if two things are competing, that's not benefiting either one. So living things don't compete because it's good for them to do. They do it because they have to. But the one thing to note is that the effect on the fitness of each competitor may not be equal. If Walmart and the mom and pop store are competing, it's hurting both of them to have competition, but the mom and pop store is hurting a lot worse, right? 
So just because two things are competing and are both negatively affected by that action, one's going to hurt a lot more. Another personal example might be if everybody in the country lost $10,000. That would hurt someone like you and me quite a bit. Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, I barely noticed it. We both lost, we both were hurt, so to speak. It affected us a lot more strongly. So competition always lowers the fitness of the organisms involved. Just a couple points. Uh, Intraspecific competition is a major factor in limiting population growth. Remember that uh, members of the same species tend to occupy the same niche. They have the same role in the environment. And so there's a lot of competition within the same species because there is a very particular role that they're playing. In plants, you can see this quite well when you have a bunch of seeds that sprout. And if you come back and take a look several um, weeks later, for instance, only a couple of individual plants will still be present in that area. These are sunflowers, and so this is called self-thinning. Competition leads to dominant individuals crowding out the less fit ones. And so these two sunflowers obviously would have had, for some, in some way, a selective advantage over the others because they persisted several weeks after all of them had initially sprouted. Self-thinning. Less fit individuals are crowded out by more dominant. It occurs in plants. They did studies of insects. They found that an increase in population density, which theoretically would mean an increase in competition, would lead to a decrease in survivorship and body length and an increase in how long it took them to develop. In lab, you guys were doing a study of radish and tomato plant competition. Unfortunately, the coronavirus uh, pandemic forced us to wrap that up sooner than I would have liked, but I did get um, I did get some uh, measurements done by some students who, who came and measured the plants on the last day we had class. And so I'm going to make that data available to you so you can all take a look at that. Some of your, um, some groups saw what we would expect. The, the clusters of plants, the treatments that had more plants, had smaller plants that didn't grow as much. Others didn't, didn't show that, but some of you saw exactly what we would expect. Increased density, increased competition, leads to a decrease in the individual fitness of all those plants involved. Interestingly enough, they did a study with roly-polies, technically known as isopods, and found that survivorship was actually lower when there were a lot of them around, even if there were enough resources. So even though every isopod had plenty of food, the fact that there were others there to share it with meant that they still tended to compete with each other even when they didn't have to. It's just kind of an interesting Interesting thought, I think. Let's see. I believe we already talked about this. This was kind of going back to how competition leads to uh, evolution. The competitive exclusion principle says that two species with the same niche cannot exist forever, which means that if two species exist together, they have to do something slightly different in the environment. So historically, there was a, a flock of finches that made it to the Galapagos Islands, and there was slight diversity in the bill shape in this population of ancestral finches. And over time, each finch was slightly better at doing something than another finch based on the way that its bill was. And the finches with larger bills would have survived by being able to crack nuts that other finches couldn't. And so natural selection favored that trade, and over time, Evolution led to the larger bill size. Likewise, finches with beaks that had a bit wider breadth would have been better at catching insects, and so natural selection favored the evolution of that beak type in those particular birds. Um, yeah, this is a good, it's an important thing to note. I honestly am not certain that it belongs here in this PowerPoint, but uh, yeah. Oh, no, here's, here's why it belongs, right up here. Fundamental versus realized niche. Yeah, so we talked about those. A fundamental niche is 
everywhere that an organism theoretically could find all of the stuff that it needs to live. However, a fundamental niche does not include competition as part of the calculations. A realized niche does include competition, and so it's going to be a lot smaller than the uh, realized niche. Yeah, here we go. Tying into the barnacles idea. So there's two different uh, species of barnacle, and they live in the intertidal zone, right? The two, uh, it's actually different, two different genuses or genera of barnacle. It's called Cathalamus and Balanus. And so if you look here, Balanus is this light bluish one, Cathalamus is the brown one. The fundamental niche of Cathalamus includes low tide, where the water tends to occur at greater, for a greater amount of time than it does near high tide. Thalamus can be found from low tide all the way up to the very tip of high tide. It's got a large fundamental niche. Thalamus needs to be closer to low tide. It needs greater moisture and a greater availability of water. It cannot survive the dry areas near high tide. Its fundamental niche does not stretch as long as that of Thalamus. However, Valinus is much better at competing in this area where the water actually allows it to survive. Basically, the fundamental niche of Valinus is the same as its realized niche because, dang it, it's a great competitor. Cathalamus could survive the entirety of the intertidal zone, but it's just not that competitive compared to Valinus. However, it can survive in this little area where Balanus can't because it's too dry for the Balanus barnacles to survive. Thalamus lives there, its realized niche is right there and does not include all of this area it could live in, but it just gets way too outcompeted by the better barnacle. That's the general idea. And I believe that's the last slide of this PowerPoint. Excellent.